A few months ago, I stumbled upon an advertisement for a brass festival in my area. From the looks of the ad, this program was designed to cater to students interested in a career in music, as well as showcase some of the finest brass faculty in the area. And as such, I was curious to see who was on faculty. While this program featured many excellent players and musicians, some of whom are my colleagues, there was one thing that was hard to miss about the faculty list. It was entirely composed of men. Being honest, this bothered me. I know many women in the area who are supremely qualified to have a place on that faculty roster, so why weren't they there? I reached out to some colleagues on the roster and decided to ask about how this list had come about. Essentially, the event organizer had decided to focus his search on Ixam orchestral musicians in the area, and if those musicians were unavailable, he would move on to other players. While there are three members of the local Ixam orchestras who are women, all three of us were either known to be unavailable and not asked, or did not respond to his email correspondence. While this raises the point that it is always good practice to ask, even if you know players won't be available to avoid misconceptions and bitter feelings, the fact still remains that there were no women on the faculty list as a result of his process. I do not believe that the event organizer consciously made the decision to exclude women from the faculty, but his chosen method of selecting faculty members had resulted in this instance. So why is this a problem? Valid points can be made about the importance of advocating for and providing work for women in the area in the name of equality, but I would like to actually focus on the students who would be attending this institute. Why is this faculty selection hurtful to young musicians who attend the program? If they are enrolling, they will be studying with extremely qualified orchestral musicians. And if that's their desired career path, this exposure to that faculty list, even as it stands right now, can be a powerful learning experience. So why is it important for them to have a roster that is a gender balanced one? Gender equality is not something that only benefits professionals gaining the employment. If anything, it is of prime importance to the young musicians and audience members we hope to serve every day. This presentation is largely based on research I completed a few years ago, but in light of this festival and of recent conversations, it has resurfaced in my mind. Before I begin, it is worth mentioning that the quantity of research contained within the subject of gender stereotypes in music is astounding. In the following lecture, I will attempt to synthesize it while noting trends I have discovered through both examining the research of others and conducting surveys and interviews of my own. However, in no way is this investigation a complete analysis of all available information. The task of processing that information, distilling the components of it, and translating that into tangible ideas and solutions would take years of data collection and research. Even so, with the limited information I have collected, there are patterns to be noticed, observations to be made, and solutions that can be found. As a woman in a professional orchestra, I have made every effort to not allow my own experiences to color my collection of data. However, I think that these experiences are important to share as they at least partially spurred my interest in the project. I acknowledge that the material I am presenting can be a hot button issue, and I think it is important to acknowledge my own history with the subject so I can present it fairly. While I do believe that several of my own experiences have been clouded by gender, I believe these are outlier experiences, and overall my career has not been strongly dictated by the perceived stereotypes or limitations of my gender. Most of my interactions within the orchestra are with men, and yet, aside from a few sporadic comments, I have not felt discriminated against during these day-to-day -day discussions. In short, up until this investigation, gender interactions and representation in my workplace seldom crossed my mind. But in collecting data and perspectives from others, I noticed that my feelings did not match up to the reality of the gender representation that surrounds me. And my perceptions were not the only ones that reflected this paradox. Many conversations I have had in developing this research have shown that many other musicians find the notion of gender to be a secondary thought in the world of orchestral performance. However, despite these mindsets, divides and underrepresentation continue to be a persistent problem in the field. As a result, 
I attempted to collect data in order to determine the specifics of this issue and just where we were coming up short in finding equality between men and women in the orchestral workplace. I remembered several years ago reviewing graphic illustrations of the underrepresentation of women in the orchestra, and I decided to begin by first revisiting those. These graphs were created by composer Subi Rahman in 2014. In this research, Rahman investigated gender representation in America's top 20 orchestras ranked by salary, represented by 1,833 individual musicians. Rahman analyzed the gender split in total between men and women in the orchestras, first by calculating the split for each orchestra and then by averaging these together. As a brief clarification, for the purpose of this original study, I am referring purely to male and female ratios. I was not able to access data for trans or non-binary musicians, as this information is not made publicly available at this time. Rahman's graph is shown here. The gender representation between men and women on this graph is almost at a two to one ratio. Rahman notes that, quote, only one elite orchestra has more women than men, the St. Louis Symphony, end quote. Rahman then breaks down this information into the instrumental sections to determine the split. This is where some of the most intriguing and enlightening information is contained. These graphs reveal an interesting phenomenon in orchestral gender composition, the huge discrepancies of gender representation between instruments. Looking at Rahman's results, the percentage of women in any given section can range from 95% in the harp section all the way to 3% in the trumpet and trombones. For every instrument contained within this sweep, there are general trends of male versus female domination in that instrument. I found this to be remarkable. To put all of this in a historical context, orchestras were entirely dominated by men until very recently in American history. Slowly, women began making their way into orchestras through hard-fought battles. And when they did, the entire world took note. In my interview with Bonita Boyd, professor of flute at the Eastman School of Music, she spoke on the hiring of Dorio Dwyer. Dwyer was one of the first women to be hired as the principal player of an American orchestra, being selected as principal flute for the Boston Symphony in 1952. Professor Boyd noted, quote, Dorio Dwyer getting the job in Boston was a national happening. It was in all the papers. My parents knew about her, the guy on the sidewalk knew. They weren't even concert goers necessarily, but she was a national heroine, unquote. Dwyer proved herself to be the exception to the rule in breaking into an entirely male-dominated field. Unfortunately, instead of becoming the norm, these cases remained the exception, and female representation in orchestras did not make a dramatic improvement until the 1970s and 80s. These changes stem from the evolution of orchestral audition practices in the 1950s, which made the process fairer to all candidates. Moving away from the tradition of authoritarian music directors like George Schulte and Fritz Reiner single-handedly appointing candidates, orchestras turned to using multiple rounds of auditions to determine the winner of the position. In the 1970s, orchestras introduced the process of screening auditions to eliminate bias in sex-based hiring. Through the use of a screen in one or more rounds of an audition, the committee of players hearing the candidates for the position would be restricted to only hearing the performer without any visual representation of the candidate's gender or ethnicity. As an aside, this auditory restriction does not always eliminate the possibility of a gender bias. As noted in an article from The Guardian, quote, the telltale sounds of a woman's shoes allegedly influenced some jury members, such that aspiring musicians were instructed to remove their footwear before coming onto the stage." Unquote. The use of a screen, however, had a dramatic impact on the inclusion of women in American orchestras. A study conducted by Harvard University in 2000 found that, quote, Using a screen to conceal candidates from the jury during preliminary auditions increased the likelihood that a female musician would advance to the next round by 11 percentage points. During the final round, blind auditions increased the likelihood of female musicians being selected by 30%, unquote. Additionally, the study concluded, quote, 
According to analysis using roster data, the transition to blind auditions from 1970 to the 1990s can explain 30% of the increase in the proportion female among new hires and possibly 25% of the increase in the percentage female in the orchestras. This was obviously a remarkable development among symphony orchestras. Women began incorporating themselves more and more into American symphonies. However, this movement differed severely in the rate of inclusion based on instrument. Returning to Rahman's visual graphics, this trend is very clearly apparent. Women tend to find a healthy and even dominant representation in instruments like the violin, harp, and flute, while trumpet, trombone, double bass, percussion, and tuba remain firmly entrenched in the trends of the pre-1970s. In order to get a better sense of these trends, I wanted to expound upon Rahman's data. As intriguing as it was, ultimately this data collection was a snapshot in time. I wondered if Rahman's figures have changed since 2014 in a way that reflects meaningful progress toward equality. In order to find out more information, I sought to replicate Rahman's study as best as I could and effectively create a second data point and observe the trends that followed. To do this, I used his exact sampling of top 20 orchestras by salary and used the personnel lists available on their individual websites. It should be noted here that Rahman provided no information on how he counted personnel lists, especially regarding issues like substitute players, fellowships, or B contract members, and did not elaborate on the method in which he calculated percentages for each orchestra. He did not respond when I reached out to him in attempting to learn more about his collection methods, Thus, I did my best to match my comparisons to Rahman, but I'm unable to say conclusively that my study mimics his exactly. The results of my collection are listed in several tables below. These charts and comparisons reveal a bit of good news for women in orchestras, but also leave some questions that are yet to be answered. It is worth noting that overall representation of women in orchestras has increased by 2% in just four years. This is not the massive shift we might hope for, but given the conditions of employment in symphony orchestras, it is a positive development. Most musicians who hold full-time positions in a symphony are tenured, and thus orchestras can go for decades without having an opening in specific sections. Under these conditions, 2% is a notably positive trend in the overall development of female employment. However, Investigating where this 2% comes from points to some continued problems in orchestral hiring. Looking at the final chart, comparing Rahman's numbers within sections to my findings, we can see that the 2% female representation increase comes primarily from the violin, cello, and flute sections. Conductors did make a slight improvement, but representation in orchestras is still very limited in these positions. These instruments were already ones that were either female dominated in the case of violin and flute or were trending in that direction in the case of cello. Instruments that were very heavily influenced by male participation, such as the brass and percussion sections, remained that way, with several instruments becoming even more strongly oriented toward male representation. Thus, what is illustrated is a continued polarization of gender in male and female typed instruments. The reason for the increase in female participation had not been more inclusion in greater areas of the orchestra, but a more dominant representation in instrument groups that were already inclined toward female participation. Given this information, I sought about trying to determine the variance between instruments. Why are certain instruments stereotyped as masculine or feminine? How do these stereotypes affect which gender chooses to pursue which instrument? To answer these questions, I looked to several studies detailing gender stereotypes and their effects on a variety of ages, from adult to collegiate to elementary education. It is important to note that gender stereotypes regarding instruments have existed, essentially, since the instruments themselves. In an article by James Bennett II, he notes, Quote, Canadian musicologist Rita Steblin points out these perceptions have existed in one way or another for centuries. Ancient Greek art showed a sort of gender stereotype reversal by modern standards. 
Women were depicted playing a double reed pipe called the aulos, associated with the female followers of Bacchus, and men were often shown with the harp or the lyre. It had masculine qualities thanks to associations with the god Apollo." Unquote. However, these perceptions have evolved over time. Sometimes these evolutions are due to logical implications. For example, brass instruments have a long history of being affiliated with the hunt or military usage. Ricky O'Bannon notes this in an article feature on the Baltimore Symphony blog. Quote, the French horn is traditionally linked with hunting, and composers who used it in the 18th and 19th centuries were often making allusions to the hunt. Trumpets have military connotations dating back to their use as signaling devices on the battlefield. And many of the most visible trumpet players in the early 20th century, particularly in the United States and United Kingdom, came directly from a military brass band tradition." Unquote. However, reasons for typecasting an instrument as masculine or feminine could also be completely arbitrary. O'Bannon notes this phenomenon as well, saying, quote, at the same time, a male preoccupation with female lips meant women were discouraged from playing brass instruments like the French horn or trumpet. Quote, women cannot possibly play brass instruments and look pretty, and why should they spoil their good looks, unquote, said Gustav Kircher in a 1904 edition of Musical Standard, unquote. Obviously, these reasons seem foolish to a modern audience but their effects can still be felt today in the gender stereotypes we assign to instruments. Studies from the universities of Windsor, Washington, and Indiana have shown just how potent and potentially damaging these effects are. The study from the University of Indiana delved into specifics on when we form these gender ideas and how long they stay with us. Harold Abellis and Susan Porter conducted a series of four experiments to determine the influence of gender stereotyping of instruments. They concluded that gender stereotypes that may be formed early in our childhood last well into adulthood and are relatively unified regardless of musical training or education. Most adults were able to agree on which instruments could be classified as masculine and which are feminine even when those adults had advanced musical training. The second two experiments in their study were designed to focus on these effects in children choosing their musical instruments. They concluded the following about their research. Quote, the boys' selections remained relatively stable at the masculine end of the scale from kindergarten through the eventual selection of an instrument. The girls' selections consistently moved toward traditionally feminine instruments, the difference between the sexes maximizing around third and fourth grades. This information is both surprising and disheartening. Gender stereotypes that last well into adulthood begin to heavily influence children right around third or fourth grade, the age when students begin typically choosing instruments in American school curriculum. These stereotypes essentially force children into selecting an instrument solely because they see it in the light of an arbitrarily assigned feminine or masculine context. Similarly, the study from the University of Windsor noted how these stereotypes can also lead to perceptions on how we view the performers of these various instruments. In their study, Kenneth Kramer, Aaron Millian, and Lynn Peralt examined the perceptions of 98 college students as they observed different gendered performers on instruments that deliberately aligned or deviated from their assigned gender stereotype. The differences in the ways these performers were perceived are dramatically affected by whether their instrument lines up with their gender. In the discussion of their findings, Kramer, Millian, and Peralt state, quote, For masculine instruments, there were no significant differences between perceptions of male and female musicians. But for feminine instruments, males were judged significantly more harshly than females. Specifically, Males playing feminine instruments were perceived as less dominant and active and had less leadership skills than females playing identical instruments. It is noteworthy that this interaction was significant only with respect to relatings in the masculine domain." Unquote. Men who performed on feminine instruments were perceived as weaker and less capable of leadership than feminine counterparts. Perceptions like these can be extremely damaging for children looking to choose their instruments, and children's participation in music can be limited to adhering to gender standards because of fears of how others will perceive them 
However, amid these somewhat depressing findings, there is a glimmer of hope. University of Windsor study also noted that exposure to counterexamples to gender stereotyped instruments improves children's interest in them. The authors note, quote, approximately 20% of girls showed an interest in playing the trombone after viewing a concert featuring a female trombone player. Yet only 2% of girls showed a similar interest after viewing a male trombone player, unquote. This trend is elaborated further with the study from the University of Washington. This investigation, conducted by Betty Repiaccioli and Samantha Pickering, used more than 600 Australian children in kindergarten and fourth grade and investigated their willingness to choose gender stereotyped instruments based on the material they were exposed to. The researchers grouped the students into three groups. Quote, in the stereotype group, the children saw males playing the masculine instruments and females playing the feminine ones. Children in a counter-stereotype group saw males playing the feminine instruments and the females playing the masculine instruments. The third, or control group, viewed a video of the music but without seeing the soloists. Instead, the instruments were displayed against a plain background." Unquote. Similarly, in a separate study, the videos were simply replaced with black and white drawings instead of videos. In both studies, researchers found that the students in the counter-stereotype group were more willing to deviate from perceived gender norms when selecting an instrument. They also noted that this effect was even more potent with girls. Quote, girls, meanwhile, were more flexible than their boy counterparts. About 70% of the fourth grade girls in the counter-stereotype group picked masculine instruments, unquote. This study illustrates a key strategy in how we can resolve this problem in gender disparity moving forward. Having strong female role models on typically masculine instruments can open the door to greater interest in children choosing that instrument for the first time, and vice versa with young boys. This phenomenon has been present in other areas of excellence as well, namely sports. In Matthew Syed's book, Bounce, he notes that after a groundbreaking success, there was a flowering over the course of a decade of participants with the same gender and nationality. For instance, in 1998, Sayri Pak won the LPGA championship, becoming the first South Korean woman to do so. That year, she was the only South Korean to participate in the tour. In 2007, nine years after her historic success, there were 33 Korean women on the LPGA tour. This phenomenon, as shown by the studies of the University of Windsor and Washington, can have the same effect in music. However, the authors of the Washington study make this disclaimer about the education and correction of gender stereotypes. Quote, our studies show these stereotypes can be modified, but I would emphasize that the changes we showed are short term. Three minute videos or drawings are not going to create permanent change. We also wouldn't advocate using counter stereotypes by themselves because we would simply be creating new stereotypes. We need to present both males and females playing a full range of instruments to show that anyone can play them. Gender should not be relevant." Unquote. Using this warning, I decided to explore another venue in which gender stereotypes could be challenged as a lasting intermediary between grade school education and the professional realm. For this solution, I had to look no further than the conservatory and university environment. I began my exploration by conducting interviews of several faculty members from the Eastman School of Music Winds and Brass Department. In choosing these interviewees, I attempted to find instruments that were typecast as masculine, Larry Zalkin on trombone, feminine, Bonita Boyd on flute, and those seeming to make a possible transition between the two, Peter Corral on horn. However, despite the discrepancies in how these instruments were perceived, all the professors seemed to echo a similar sentiment. Gender had not played a dominant role in either their performing or teaching. I asked each professor whether they noticed any differences between their male and female students. Professor Zulkin responded by saying, quote, I do, but the differences between my students aren't consistent based on gender. They are consistent based on who they are. Two women in my studio are as different as the men, unquote. Professor Corral echoed this mindset by responding with, quote, 
I don't notice anything distinctive. I mean, I think there are quirks on both sides. There are really strong credentials with either gender, unquote. Professor Boyd noted, quote, as far as quality, there are no differences between my male and female students, unquote. These observations and thoughts from the professors seem to contradict the statistics that I had found from major symphony orchestra personnel lists, and even from the studies I had reviewed. Presented with this information, I began to wonder if the perceptions of these faculty members were based in the reality of their conservatory environment. In order to compare the gender composition of a collegiate environment like Eastman to the environment I had already explored in the professional symphony orchestra, I attempted to recreate my previous research methods with the personnel of the Eastman orchestras. For the purposes of my study, I chose to only explore the personnel lists of the Eastman Philharmonia. This is Eastman's top performing ensemble that adheres to the same general personnel composition found in the major American symphonies. However, the personnel of this ensemble is not consistent throughout an entire semester as students rotate from one concert to another. As a result, I contacted the Special Collections Department at the Sibley Music Library to obtain copies of all the personnel lists from concert programs of three sets of academic years, 2009 to 2010, 2013 to 2014, and 2017 to 2018. I chose to use academic years that were four years apart, the typical span of an undergraduate education, so that there would be little overlap between musicians and the ensemble. I used the personnel list from each concert in that academic year and then used that information to create a percentage of gender representation. From this, I created a collective average across all three academic years to determine a general percentage of gender representation in the ensemble. To illustrate my findings, I added this final average to my original table with Rahman's data and my updated investigation into major professional orchestras. As an aside, for this comparison, I left out the position of conductor as the same faculty conductor was the director of the majority of these concerts simply because of his position in the school. My statistics are presented here. As evidenced above, Eastman's personnel composition was markedly more inclusive than the trends of the professional symphony orchestra. The Eastman Philharmonia has a very balanced overall composition with a slightly female favoring a 46% male to 54% female members. This is in stark contrast to the heavily male-dominated numbers found in professional orchestras. Looking to gender composition within instrument sections, there are vast improvements as well. In almost every single instrument group, female participation was significantly higher than in both Rahman's and my collection of major symphony data. Even in the case of flute, the instrument was much less polarized in the direction of women and offered more inclusion of men. While there is still plenty of evidence of gender stereotyping in instruments, brass personnel is still male-dominated and harp still female-dominated, the extent of this bias is notably less potent than it is in the professional environment. While this is a focus on one collegiate ensemble out of many across the country, the numbers here tell an optimistic tale for the future of gender representation in the orchestral performance field. Eastman and other conservatory and university environments like it are the training ground for the world of professional orchestral performance. Students attend these institutions and participate in ensembles to accumulate experience that will help them in the real world. If gender representation is much better in this preparatory environment, it is my belief and hope that this will begin to translate to the professional realm in the years to come. The research I have compiled here from both professional orchestras and conservatory personnel points to the slow changing of gender relationships in favor of more equal representation. Slowly, things are shifting in the orchestral world. The conservatory professors I interviewed also noted this phenomenon of a changing gender dynamic in American orchestras and the move away from the way things were. However, the effects have not yet statistically manifested themselves in the professional orchestras examined above. As mentioned before, the tenured status of symphony musicians will prevent this process from being an expedited one. However, with the audition practices of screening and the more inclusive conservatory makeup shown above, 
it is reasonable to believe that the changes seen in conservatory environments will slowly begin to manifest themselves in the professional realm. There is still a long way to go in terms of achieving equality. The reservations expressed earlier in this lecture by researchers at the University of Washington reflect the need for constant assimilation and inclusion of both men and women in all instruments. However, despite these concerns and challenges, the conservatory gender representation paints a hopeful picture for the future. Harkening back to Dory O'Dwyer, her achievements were noted by the entire country. Using the logic of Matthew Syed, there's reason to believe that her accomplishments have inspired generations of female flutists and perhaps have led to the predominance of women in that section. This phenomenon will likely be just as relevant in the future. As the gender representation seen in a conservatory environment begins to manifest in the professional realm, new female role models will begin to emerge in each section. There are already powerful female figures for each instrument, but as these become more frequent and common, the entire country will begin to take note. It is my hope that over time, with the help of gender-balanced environments like that of the conservatory, this shift in what is considered feminine and masculine will lead to the de-gender stereotyping of instruments. If the brass and percussion families can be demasculinized, so too will the flute, harp, and violin become defeminized. Perhaps then, the gender balance among instruments will begin to even out across the entire orchestra, eliminating the current pockets of male or female domination. So what is our role in this process? The presence of an equal gender composition in performance faculty has the ability to meaningfully change the lives of those students who attend. Based on the studies mentioned earlier, it is a powerful experience to see people in positions of leadership who look like you. Looking back to the brass festival I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, while I do not believe that the event organizer had any ill intent with attempting to find the top orchestral musicians of the area, by restricting himself in this way, he is inadvertently hurting those students who participate. There are plenty of qualified women throughout the country and the world capable of teaching and working with all ages and abilities of students. Taking the time to seek these women out and make a point of including them on your faculty will help the students you are trying to serve. For the young women who attend this festival or any others like it, a female faculty member is an empowering example of how they can achieve their goals. They can see themselves in the teacher in front of them. Without this gender balance, it is much easier for these young, promising players to be discouraged, and what a tragedy it would be to lose the opportunity to hear the next great principal horn player because of the lack of representation. It goes without saying that this process will take decades to fully realize, and it will certainly not come automatically. One brass festival or collegiate studio featuring a female faculty member will not lead to significant change, but many of them can. It is important that from the earliest age until adulthood, we collectively combat gendered instrument stereotypes and point to counterexamples on both sides of the spectrum. This process is one that, in the long run, will benefit the national musical landscape at large and have a profound effect on the quality of classical music in our country. For this reason alone, gender inclusion across all instruments is a goal and even our collective responsibility that should be taken seriously and pursued with unceasing determination and motivation to improve the quality of an art form that we all value and love.